Well, the Sisters of Mercy Convent had been around for more than 170 years in St. John's. It opened in 1842, setting up the convent, then establishing a school for girls, opening St. Clair's Hospital, a senior's home, and a homeless shelter. Tonight, we have a documentary looking at the impacts of the Sisters of Mercy as told by some of the former students, including Susan Quinn, the founder and artistic director of the Quintessential Vocal Ensemble. Her desire to pay tribute to Mercy led to this documentary with producer Roger Monder. I'm just going to put some chords in um, Well, Mercy, Mercy Convent is closing and the school has been closed since 1992. And I just trust that people have uh, good memories and continue in their lives with good values that were taught us through through this place you know through the school and from the sisters who lived here in this convent over the years uh, it is difficult definitely going to miss it I'm Sister Rosemary Ryan. Music was a part of our lives growing up, and here at Mercy, we were all privileged to be able to have piano lessons, and it was taught during the school day. You were taken out of the classroom and for your music lesson, so it was just, just a part of us, right from family, and then certainly all up through school. I know religious life was highly valued, I think, in my family. My mother was educated through mercy, and uh, you know, the sisters always held high regard in her opinion. It was never verbally suggested to me, you know, but just, um, I don't know, there was just an inclination there that maybe, maybe I would like that type of life. And uh, I finished grade 11 when I was 16, and you know, I entered then at, at 16. My brothers frequently say now, you know, you were only 16, you know. But anyway, that was the way it was then, you know. Most of us were 16, 17, 18. You know, school was uh, meant to be enjoyed. We never came out of, out of fear or anything like that. So I would like for, you know, any of the ex-students to remember that and to remember all of the extra things that were done. I think um, the sisters really instilled a really strong um, passion for music. I think music was always such a big thing for Mercy, especially choral singing. I mean, it was something somehow innate in them. And I think that it was because it was such a beautiful form of expression, you know? It was a way for um, people to, to use their talents um, to create beauty and enjoyment. Um, and it goes hand in hand. I think with with everything that they're about. Well, we we practiced a lot, and it was part of the curriculum. And the nice thing about it is we could get private music lessons for little or nothing. So anyone who had any kind of interest or talent certainly could you know w could benefit from that. The chapel is right here. My music room is just behind behind this door, and this is where our music our, our instruments were every day. So I came into this room every single day. And I remembered it just being such an incredibly special place, but I wanted to see it as a grown adult because I hadn't seen this chapel since I was in grade eight. So of course, and this is like four weeks ago, of course I go into the chapel and I'm like, and I just went, you know, I clapped right away to see what the acoustics were like. And I s turned to Sister Rosemary and I was like, I have to get in here and sing before these doors close. I always wanted to get QBE one of my choirs to get into that chapel and sing a cappella. Well, I think, you know, music is something you either listen to in your car, go to concerts. I mean, it's 
The bit of geography that you would do, well, you can learn that anywhere now. I'm not putting down the essentials of math and English and sciences, you know, they're so important. But, you know, music stays with a person. It can transport you into another world of beauty, but also into a world of emotional expression. It's a portal to to a kind of a spiritual realm, honestly. You know, it's, um, it's a, a, a kind of beauty. It, almost everything that happens in our lives, I think, whether it's death or birth or sadness or whatever, is somehow able to be expressed in music in a way that is empathetic. It, it, it helps you through whatever crisis you're going through. Music is my go-to. There's nothing really, there's nothing like it. One thing about the arts is that it really helps people gain confidence, and I think that that's been a huge influence for a lot of people. You know, many, many, many people were very, very, very kind to me and treated me uh, very well. You know, I went through a kind of golden era at Mercy. When I think about Mercy, I have very fond memories of it, and I, I, I guess maybe that's, you probably found that quite common. I'm just proud of all these connections and generations of people, and I'm proud of how well I was treated here. We were so well-rounded and well-educated from an early age. I hope it is, you know, part of our a part of our legacy that they can uh, look back and see, you know, what they were given in school. And it was done sometimes with uh, substantial sacrifices. Like with the Mercy Congregation, because we have a vow of poverty, all of our money goes into the, the common pot, shall we say. And uh, because we pool our money together, we have the opportunity of giving uh, substantial help to different groups, certainly to groups that we um, appreciate and value, like some of the music groups now that are probably not getting some of the attention they deserve in the school systems. So uh, we like to support some of these areas that are in need and are dear to our hearts. Even when we built Holy Heart, you know, that was that was built by paid for by our salaries, and uh, we were delighted to do it. It was the Archbishop's dream, Archbishop Skinner's dream, to have a central uh, high school for girls, and he came to both congregations to see if they could fund it, so a lot of our salaries were put into that. So some of these sacrifices, I guess, um, you know, I think the girls are aware of them now as adults. They wouldn't have been aware of them when they were going to school, but as adults they are, and I think that develops an appreciation for, for what was done for them, you know, what was given to them. Who was your biggest influence here when it came, came to music? Well, without a doubt, Sister Catherine Bellamy. She changed my life completely. She was one of the ones, you know, almost, you know, an inspiration for this place. Oh, yes. Because she was working with the poor. She started the Emmaus House Food Bank over there with five parishes. She was one of the loveliest, nicest, kindest people I ever met in my life. You know, it, there was nothing you could do or say to her that she, she was just understanding and accepting, and, and she loved her Mercy Girls. She really did. I mean, if the convent continues on to, uh, to help the poor, uh, you know, that, that all makes so much sense. 
we're just we're, we're moving on into the future and moving the right way mm -hmm. and all from the vision of a woman who I loved and who changed my life mm -hmm. you know gosh this was meant to be <laughs> oh, lots of inspiration around yeah <laughs> yeah love this is going with us Wow. That's it. Somebody's living in here. Yeah. Right? Me. <laughs> Rosemary Rhine. This uh, place was always known as our mother house. It's the very first convent that was on this side of the Atlantic. Mercy convents were in Ireland and England in 1842, but ours was the first on this side of the Atlantic. There were easily 50 of us here in the early 60s, and now there are three of us here. And when we look at it, there were three sisters who came out from Ireland, the three who came out in 1842, and here there are three of us left here in the house now, so we hope that we are as faithful as they were. The convent wouldn't be here only for their fidelity and that they could put up with the hardships way back in 1842, so hopefully we're continuing what they started. It's bittersweet in a way. It's uh, bitter to know, you know, it would be going from our hands. But we do have dreams of it serving the more vulnerable in the future. We don't know how that will, how that will be, either for as low income housing or in, in some way to, to serve the vulnerable. And we certainly think that our, our foundress, Catherine McCauley, would be delighted with that. I'm very happy that the physical building is still there and still being used for what I would call a very socially important purpose as the gathering place. And you know, you, that, that sort of eases the, the sadness of it. I remember being in the school gym or the auditorium and singing the school song. I, I can't believe I still remember it since I learned it when I was five. Um, and I'm sure like other people will remember it, but it went, blue and silver shall we wear in honor of Our Lady Fair. That's all I remember. <laughs> I worry about some of our young people who claim that they don't believe in God or, uh, you know, they have no religion. I'm not talking about attending mass all the time, you know, I'm just talking about having a spirituality, something that they can lean on and fall back on because hard times come to everybody. I just would love for people to have something to cling on to, something in life that gives them meaning and they'll have something to fall back on in the hard times.
Beautiful piece of Newfoundland history. That was Mercy, a documentary about the Sisters of Mercy by Roger Maunder. That's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a lovely evening.